In the Bible, there are a lot of stories about mountains. There are stories about Moses leading the people out of Egypt and going to Mount Sinai and receiving the law. And there's a story about how his face just continued to glow in God's radiance so much that he had to put a veil over his face because the people could not look upon him. And it just really depicts the radiance and glory and majesty of the Father. There's a story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. 4,000 prophets of Baal proclaiming that their God is stronger than the God of heaven. And most of us know what happens in that story. No matter what the Baal prophets do, cannot duplicate what the Lord does. And so over and over again, there's these stories in the mountains that God is at work. And I was thinking about myself. Like, what mountain story do I have? And I remember when I was in junior high school, I had just played a, a summer league basketball game. And there was this story about this mountain that they said was going to erupt for two months. And on that day, I looked outside and I looked over my shoulder and this is what I saw. I saw this plume of smoke. It, almost, it looked like almost an atomic bomb went off. And I thought, man, is that what I think it is? That thing just erupted. You see, there used to be stories about this guy named Harry Truman. Harry Truman, not the president Harry Truman, but there was a guy named Harry R. Truman uh, that lived in Mount St. Helens. He's 83 years old. He had 16 cats, and so he uh, made the Sedans look pretty small in comparison. 16 cats, and he always had Coca-Cola and whiskey. And every time he had an interview, he had the mouth of someone that, let's just say, had a lot of words come out that weren't appropriate. And he would tell people that he's not leaving this mountain and that nobody could scare him away, that he had lived there for 52 years. And in those 52 years, he's seen all kinds of rumblings at this mountain. And no matter how much it spewed, he was always okay. So he just said, man, I'm not leaving this mountain. No one can make me leave this mountain. I know this mountain. He lived in this lodge. It was called the Mount St. Helens Lodge. He owned it. He had lived there for 52 years. And he said he wasn't afraid of any kind of volcanic activity because at Mount St. Helens, he was protected by the forest and he was protected by the Spirit Lake there. And so though everybody in that whole community, everybody in that whole lodge, they all left. Except for Harry Truman. He decided that I'm going to weather this storm. And most of us know that that didn't turn out that well. That mountain that at one point, the peak was 9,677 feet, had been blasted away until you were left with about, you know, 15 to 1,600 feet less of that top right there. And remember that the water and the forest that Harry Truman thought would protect him? This was what was left of the forest as the lava came just pouring down and it made that forest, those trees, look like twigs. That's the story that I know about mountains. But the thing about this mountain is when everyone was done talking about this, the thing that people focused on was the majestic power of the mountain. But today we're going to look at a story that involves Jesus taking three of his disciples to a mountain and the focus will not be on the mountain but it'll be on Jesus so in your chapter 9 uh, verses 2 through 4 it starts off simply by saying that after six days Jesus took with him Peter and James and John he always traveled in a group because that makes the testimony all that much better. 
If someone went one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and said, this is what I saw, you might think, oh, you know what, you're kind of delusional. But Jesus would take his disciples in groups and pairs, and this was his closest pair. And it says he led them up a high mountain. Now, in Israel, the highest mountain there is 9,232 feet. It's called Mount, Mount Hermon. And a lot of people say, that's where he took him. He took him to Mount Hermon. But the reality is, is that we don't know the exact mountain that Jesus took him to. And it's actually a good thing because if we knew the name of the mountain, then we would give attention to the mountain. And so what happened along the way is that this mountain simply became known as the Mount of Transfiguration because the focus was not on the mountain. The focus was on the transfiguration. The focus was on what happened uh, to Jesus when Peter, James, and John went to this mountain. It says in the next verses there that he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, and no one on earth could bleach them. So you get this image here of Jesus, who you're walking with, all of a sudden he like changes. And, and the Greek word for transfiguration, transfigured, is the word metamorphio. And it's where we get the English word metamorphosize. And so that term talks about somebody that tra changes into something of more prominence. And you see a lot of that if you are a Marvel fan. You see some of these superheroes, you know, uh, the Hulk, right? Or Captain Marvel now that just kind of metamorphosizes into something of either greater prominence. So the disciples see him glowing. They see him intensely white, right? And it talks about in the book of Luke that not only was his clothes radiant, but his face was, it illuminated. And when they're there, they also see two other people there, Elijah and Moses. And they see them talking, right? They see them talking, and if you actually look at Luke 9, you, you get to understand what the content of the conversation is. They're actually talking about being prepared for when Jesus goes down to Jerusalem, which is when he's going to die for our sins, and he's going to be resurrected. And so you see these key prominent figures. They're, they're discussing, they're having this conversation about what's going to take place. And... As Peter, James, and John look at this conversation, they make a mistake. They place Jesus on par with Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses, I mean, they're famous, right, because of the law, right? They represent the old covenant. They're famous because Elijah was known as one of the greatest prophets of all time. And so in their presence were three figures that were prominent when it came to how God has moved throughout history. You had Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. What would you do if you were in there? If you were standing in the presence of people that you revered and you considered to be of great stature? Well, we know what Peter did, right? Peter looks up at this illumination, looks up and sees that, that Jesus is brighter and more radiant than anything. And he concludes, Rabbi, it is good. It is good that we are here. And he says, let us make three tents. Uh, or it's also translated as tabernacles. Three shelters, uh, three things that symbolize that you are of important and of equal status, that you are prominent, right? And so they sit there and they debate about making three separate tents. So it's because he didn't know what to say because he was terrified. Like, would you be terrified if you were in their place? 
if all of a sudden the person that you walked up the mountain all of a sudden transfigures to the point of just being more than you can really stare at? Would you be terrified if you all of a sudden saw two men appear that weren't even with you on the journey? I mean, these guys were fearful and they were afraid. And they say, let's treat them with equal status. Let's treat them so that they're the same. And verse 7 talks about this cloud, right? And when you look at this section here, this story about the transfiguration, there are all kinds of symbolism that you would know from Moses, right? There's the radiant glow of the people that encounter God. Uh, there's this cloud that kind of follows them and overshadows them. There's this mountain that they climb where they are in the presence of God. And it says this cloud overshadows them. And a voice from the cloud simply says this, this is my beloved son. Think about that for a second. There's this mountain, there are these people that you consider to be prominent people, and then all of a sudden they're covered, and it's like an illusionist, right? Like some of those shows that you watch as kids, where all of a sudden there's this thing here that covers them, and then when they pull away the, the, the tablecloth or something, there's one person standing. And who is the person that's standing? The person that's standing is Jesus. Jesus is the last one left. And so I was trying to figure out a way to make this practical for you so that you can understand the significance of this event. And one of the things that I was thinking about was, who are the most widely held religious leaders of our day that people honor? whether you're a Christian or not. Who are some of these people that people put on a pedestal? Francis Chan. I was thinking a little bit higher scale, right? I was thinking a little bit like, there are people that look at somebody like Mohammed and someone like Buddha and somebody like maybe the Dalai Lama, right? And we could put Francis Chan up there. But there are people that... When you're looking at Jesus, you're saying, and there's a lot of religions that say they're just the same, right? Islam believes in Jesus. Buddhism recognizes Jesus as somebody that achieved nirvana. And so they wouldn't have a problem building two tabernacles. They wouldn't have a problem at all or three tabernacles. But in that context, if the cloud covers them, who's going to be the last person standing? It's going to be Jesus. See, that's what God the Father is trying to illustrate, that there's only one person that's his son. And secondly, there's only one person that you should be listening to. Jesus is that mouthpiece of God. Jesus is that one that... But God the Father says, none of these other people are my beloved son, but him. And that's the person that you should be listening to. And that's significant. Because today in our culture, we have a lot of voices. And we have a lot of people that we consider influential that we listen to. You have teachers that proclaim certain philosophies and ideologies. You have people that you affirm and you look at them at a higher level. Maybe there's a celebrity. Maybe there's an author that you just hold to this high esteem. Maybe there's a parental figure or a child Maybe there's a political party that you identify with and you are gung-ho about that and boy, you will get into any kind of debate or argument because you believe in their position. Who are the people of influences in your life? 
When I think about the students here, I think about who are the people of influence in your life? Who are the people that you hold to high regard? And if you took them on this mountain and they were shoulder to shoulder with Jesus, who would the Lord say, this is who I want you to listen to? It'd be Jesus. But here's the thing is that sometimes Jesus is the last person that we listen to. Sometimes we like to listen to our podcasts or our teachers or our authors or our professors. And we know what Jesus wants us to do, but we don't want to listen to him. I was watching a Francis Chan video, and he was talking about the game Simon Says. Everybody knows how to play Simon Says. Simon Says, pat yourself on the head. Simon said, pat yourself on the head. Right? But the game that we have the most problem with is called Jesus Says. Right? And so Chan uses this analogy. He goes to his daughter. She's like 14 years old. And he goes, Rachel, clean your room. And Rachel he imagines, looks at her and says, Dad, I just heard what you said. You said, clean your room. In fact, Dad, I'm going to memorize that. Rachel, clean your room. And not only that, Dad, I'm going to learn the Greek for that term. Rachel, clean your room. And, and in fact, I'm going to invite my friends and we're going to have a study and we're going to study what it means, Rachel, clean your room. Sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? But when it comes to Jesus, like he tells us to live a certain way. He tells us to share about him. He tells us to love our neighbors and to love people. He tells us to forgive. Jesus says, forgive those people that have caused problems in your life. Jesus says, show grace to people that are bothering you because I showed grace to you. He says right here, he said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Because he holds the key of life. In the end, you can listen to all kinds of other people in the world, but he's the last one standing. The last one standing. And so as the story comes down to, from its climax to it's epilogue. It says, Jesus looks at them and he says, as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And then they kept the matters to themselves because they were like, what does it mean raising from the dead? You see, the transfiguration, it meant nothing to the disciples because they didn't understand what the purpose or the meaning was behind it. They recognized that somehow God has chosen Jesus out of these religious figures that they consider to be of equal status. But imagine them coming down the hill, telling people about what just happened. Oh, man, you wouldn't believe this, but, you know, we were going up the mountain, and we were there, then all of a sudden Jesus transforms, he, he returns, he's glowing, he's radiant, and then all of a sudden Elijah comes there, and Moses, and we're like, whoa, let's build tabernacles for them, and then this big giant cloud came, and then all of a sudden Elijah and Moses were gone, and we heard God say, Jesus is the one that you should listen to, he's my beloved son. 
Like, if they would tell people that story before Jesus rose from the dead, people might think, okay, uh, were there some magic mushrooms on the way up this mountain? Because it's a crazy story, right? It's a crazy story, and Jesus wants to communicate that he is so glorious, he is so radiant, that you can't even look upon him. And the problem is, is that we're the only ones that don't recognize that. And Mark has gone out of his way to say, this man taught like no one else could teach. This man healed people. This man cured disease. This man calmed the storm. This man cast out demons. This man raised the child from the dead. Do you know who's in the boat, right? And all of a sudden now, will you consider Moses and Elijah something special? They don't compare to Jesus. Listen to him. But Jesus was going to Jerusalem. And he was going to be raised from the dead. And what was happening in the transfiguration is once they saw that he was raised from the dead, they said, oh, it makes sense. It makes sense now. Because Jesus was giving him a foreshadow of what a glorified body would look like after they died. Because think about it, he was talking to Moses and Elijah, and they appeared also transfigured before them. It's a clue about, hey, as you go through life and you're afraid, let it be known that you will live. May that give you courage, but this will make no sense to you until I rise from the dead. Then you will remember this story and you'll be able to connect the dots there. Like this was God's way of communicating to them. You need to understand who Jesus is when you see him die. He will be back in his glorious presence, 2.0, better than he was before. And that's what this is communicating to us. But here's the problem. The problem is, is Jesus tells them not to tell anybody until he'd been raised from the dead. And they kept that. The problem is us. You see, we live at a time where we know that he's been raised from the dead. But often we keep that a secret. We don't tell people about this Jesus who died for our sins and rose from the dead. Some, sometimes we do. But more than often we, we keep that a secret. And so during the community group that we had, the life group, the, a question was, I just, I don't feel prepared I don't know how to answer those questions that I get. And some people think they have to take evangelism course or they have to be trained in the church, discipleship 101. They have to memorize some kind of a script, evangelism explosion, the four spiritual laws. But you see, God has made each one of us in his own image. And all he wants us to do is to be ourselves. Your own personality. Your own style of communication. Your own style of thinking, right? Because each person here was made in the image of God. And you have the ability to be a witness. But many times we're conditioned to think we're not ready. The demon, remember the guy, the demoniac, he had... Uh, a legion of demons cast out and Jesus told him, no, you stay here and you tell them about what the Lord has done and how he's shown you mercy. He had no training, but he had a story. And that's what people need to hear from us is our story. So we role played in our group and we asked each other these questions. Why are Christians so judgmental? And with gentleness and respect, we said, let's answer some of these questions. Why are Christians so judgmental? 
You know, I wonder that myself. Because sometimes I even feel judged by Christians. Like my faith isn't good enough. But we should be the last people to be judgmental because we've been forgiven. That's real. That's you. That's not theological. Somebody said, what about the Big Bang Theory? You know, I'm not a scientist, but I'm willing to do some research. But from my perspective, you either believe that the cosmos existed first or you believe God did. And I just fall into the category of I believe God created everything, even if it was this Big Bang that you talk about. I don't believe it came out of nothing because nothing comes out of nothing. People were talking about, you're, you're always trying to convert me. You know, if I come across like I'm trying to convert you, I, I just want to apologize because you and I both know that I can't convert you. I can only share with you, but really, this is between you and God. But I care for you. Care for you enough to share. So do you see what I'm saying? It's like Jesus says, I've been raised from the dead. Now it's okay to share. But you don't have to have this great theological training. You just got to be yourself in your circle of influence, in your peers. And just humbly, right? First Peter, it says, you know, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect so that those who speak maliciously against your conduct will be ashamed. Holy Spirit, help me to communicate my faith to other people. Help me to answer without becoming defensive. Because I know, God, you don't have to defend yourself. But it's my responsibility to share. And if we as a church started to practice that with people in our circles, I guarantee you we'd see more people come into Christ because God's waiting to use you. It's just that you can't keep it a secret to yourself. You've got to share. And so uh, this year, you know, I want to covenant with you. Let's, let's start trusting God. Let's start sharing in our own language, in our own way, what the Lord has done to our lives and how he's shown us mercy. Let us forgive like Jesus told us to forgive. No matter what people have done, because we've been forgiven. Marguerite said, I don't want to lose my saltiness. Well, people help you to lose your saltiness, and so maybe that's the challenge, is that we have to see how salty we are. Anyway, I'm done. I, I, I think I've communicated this. Who you worship is beyond anyone you can imagine. More glorious, more radiant, more holy. And I pray that in your heart that becomes more of a reality and that you will have confidence to share with other people just like you would share about your kid or something significant in your life or even your supervisor who makes you mad that you would share with people Jesus and show them that he's an important part of your life. Let me pray. God, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for our people, Lord. I thank you that most people know you, and I pray, God, for those of us that are struggling with you, that your spirit would permeate our heart and that we would see you clearly, God, we would see that you're the last one standing among all the influences and all the things in our lives and that you love us. I pray this in your name. Amen.